Which of these rolling status symbols shows you do it CNET style? Why you're obsessing on the wrong thing about your engine? And the top five ways the man decides what technology is in your car. Time to check the tech. We see cars differently. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Hello everybody, I'm Brian Cooley and welcome to CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. This week coming to you from the shop of our friend Michael Vogel. A little later on, we're going to be digging into an engine to explain one of the biggest mysteries of them that you don't understand. But first, not one engine, but two. The big V8s that live in the bows of the BMW 750 Li and the Lexus LS460 F Sport. We put these two head to head the other day and never have I been so comfortable in the field. Well, here we have two cars that really represent the pinnacle of what a lot of folks mean when they say a really nice car. The 2013 BMW 750 Li and the 2013 Lexus LS460 in the F Sport trim. Let's find out how they really differ in their essence as we check the tech. Now, rather than go through these guys with an exhaustive bullet-by-bullet head-to-head -bullet -head comparison and spend an hour doing so, instead, I want to find out how these two cars that both can print CNET style do so differently to let you figure out which one is really right for you. First off, these two cars' dashboards speak tech differently. The Lexus says it sort of loudly, more button-rich and crisp and somehow busier. The BMW is by no means basic, but its tech interfaces play second fiddle to creature comforts. In cars at this level, the basics better be standard, so you'll find GPS navigation with live traffic, Bluetooth calling, and a backup camera with good guidance overlays, and those are standard on both cars. Though it wasn't that long ago that BMW nickeled and dimed you for most of that stuff. And speaking of cameras, R750 has the optional walleye cams installed up front. And while they're of somewhat dubious value, they're not found on the Lexus. You steer the Lexus interface with this inverted puck they call the remote touch controller. It moves the cursor, offers punch to enter, and uses haptic feedback as it bumps over things on the screen. But it badly needs a back button. BMW has endured the years of sneers and jeers to turn iDrive into one of the best in-car interfaces. You steer it with this iDrive knob and handful of associated shortcut buttons, including one for back. And interestingly, BMW has removed haptic feedback as iDrive matured. I found voice command in the Lexus was quick to understand me, but requires parsing an address into many parts or button presses. Enter an address. Enter an address. Say only the city name or say change state. San Francisco. BMW is also quick on the uptake, but lets you blurt out an address, the most complicated thing you'll typically do with voice, all in one phrase. 1000 Van Ness Avenue, San Francisco, California. Processing your input. Did you mean 1000 S Van Ness Avenue, San Francisco? Both cars play the greatest hits of modern audio sources, with just a few differences. The Lexus is the car of these two that supports iTunes tagging with its HD radio, but the BMW has a 20 gigabyte hard drive to rip to. Both are equally useless to most people. Which brings us to apps. Lexus is part of Toyota. That means they get the excellent Entune app suite, renamed Enform here. It's a basket of name brand cloud loaded apps, including Yelp, OpenTable, Pandora, Bing, iHeartRadio, and Facebook Places, and that's standard. BMW's app support is still optional, and it just rolls up Facebook, Twitter, and web radio via an iPhone app, no Android. But built into the car, regardless of phone, is Google Search, which is killer, and now Yelp as well. And note that BMW has built in 3G in the car, where Lexus requires you tether your phone to get connected. Whether you're listening to one of those streaming apps or AM radio, Mark Levinson's 19 speakers and 400 watts on the Lexus, 
or Bang & Olufsen's 16 speakers and good grief 1200 watts in the BMW mean both cars can be optioned with sound better than you can hear. Cars like this don't just treat backseat passengers like hitchhikers. The Lexus wins on total rear seat comforts, optionable to include reclining Shiatsu massage, butterfly headrests, rear seat cooler, and air purifier. You can tell the Germans still inwardly scoff at such nonsense, but have dragged themselves to include heated and cooled massage seats. Where they score big is the best dual rear screen entertainment system in the biz. They're a generous size, they're nice and thin, but notice what's really interesting. They are iDrive interfaces with an iDrive controller. You've got access to multimedia, radio, navigation, all the same services you've got in the front of the car. You've also got connected drive. So without having to bring an iPad to the car, you've got some modest degree of online services right here in the vehicle built in. Both these cars are V8 powered. The Lexus has the bigger 4.6 liter V8, but the BMW slaps a pair of turbos on its smaller 4.4 liter. The BMW ends up with more horsepower, more torque, and it's quicker. And even though that 7 Series weighs more and is faster, both cars deliver identical MPG. So you gotta hand it to BMW here, at least on paper. Now to get that equal efficiency with higher power and weight, BMW had to add complexity in the form of brake force electricity regeneration, borrowed from hybrid cars, and engine automatic start-stop, which I still find rather crudely executed, but luckily defeatable. Being luxury rides, both these cars come on suave at first, unless you dig down into their powertrain. But when you do, the BMW's power and road handling make it a more serious driver's car to my hands, even though the Lexus is an F-Sport. Both cars have a handful of engine, transmission, and suspension profiles, from eco to aggressive. And they do offer pronounced differences from one end to the other, though I think three settings would probably be ample, guys. BMW offers a head-up display to extend the interface to the windshield, as well as night vision that is now actually not totally disorienting. But I really enjoy the Lexus Enform apps base on the road and find its big interface and brands of content more useful than BMW's rather stern translation of Twitter and Facebook, which I don't need in the car anyway. If you need help driving, both cars are there for you. Lexus has active lane drift technology, but passive blind spot tech. BMW's lane drift and blind spot are now both active in the 7, each car offers adaptive cruise control. The Lexus can also do front collision warning and even bring the car to a stop at city speeds if you're too busy fiddling with your coffee to watch what you're doing. BMW leaves you alone to rear end someone in independent Bavarian fashion. Okay, the bottom line on these two cars begins with the bottom line, which is quite different. I teched up that BMW, dialed it in CNET style, and pushed 108,000. Did a similar tech load on the Lexus, and I couldn't quite break 90. So about an $18,000 delta, not silly money. In terms of their character, the BMW has a real serious executive sedan feel to it, but it's a real gutter fighter on the street when you push it hard. The Lexus, I think, a little less so, even as an F-Sport but it has more of a joie de vie about the technology in it. It's a real tech toy. Play it that way. Okay, I got to admit it. That shoot was one of those days where I probably should have been paying CNET. Think about it. I'm out in a 750 and an LS in a place you should recognize. Not by name, but it's called Consulman Road in Marin County outside San Francisco. You know it from a ton of car commercials you've seen on TV. We're very lucky to have it in our backyard. By the way, you can find our specific reviews on the 750 and the LS at cars.cnet.com. Not a lot of windshield to clip a Garmin on this 61 Julietta vintage race car. Not a lot of windscreen to stop bugs for that matter. But I'm sure in your car there's room for either something on the dash, on the phone, or on the windshield that is GPS nav related. In fact, if you're watching this show, you've probably got two or three of the above. But a few tips on using them more efficiently is always of interest to the smarter driver. You know what this is? A lot of you have probably never even seen one. That's a paper map. And that used to be the essence of navigation in a car. Are you kidding? They call these screens distracting? With this thing up, I can hardly even see out the windshield. Forget that. 
Now, just because you're taking advantage of the ubiquity of GPS nav today in Dash, on your phone, on a clip-on device, doesn't mean you're doing it really well. Working with State Farm researcher Steve Roberson, we've come up with an interesting little toolkit, simple free tips to be savvy about using GPS. Now, clipping one of these GPS PNDs on your windshield like that, by doing so, you just broke the law in more than half the states in the U.S. And even the ones that do allow you to do this have very specific rules about where you can put it. You probably didn't know that. Now, whatever kind of navigation device you're using, Dash, PND, or smartphone, know if it accepts destinations emailed to it in advance without you having to tediously type it in and be distracted in the process. Ford, GM, Nissan, OnStar, Garmin, Google Maps, just some of the companies that support this kind of feature. Now, if you're using your smartphone as your navigation device, turn the screen off and just listen to the vocal prompts that'll come from just about any decent smartphone nav app. And if this little speaker is not loud enough to hear you say, head southwest on Mission Street toward First Street. No problem. Aux cable it or Bluetooth stream it to your head unit. And for most systems, those nav commands will come in and override music or whatever else you have playing on this device or on your head unit. And finally, and this may sound low tech, and frankly it is, but familiarize yourself with the route that this device is about to take you on. Rescuers are warning of a troubling tendency, drivers who rely too heavily on the satellite guided system. Uh, you've heard of death by GPS? It's no joke. People have lost their lives or had accidents because they followed an inaccurate or errant map. Many of these navigation devices have a preview mode that lets you basically fly through where you're going to be taken. So heads up, and to know your route ahead of time is good because then you really know where you are, not just finding yourself somewhere and not knowing how you got there or how to get out. Coming up, we'll explain the most misunderstood and important part of your engine's technology as CNET on Cars continues. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. And I'm also a little embarrassed that it's taken us this long to get to the Car Tech 101 we're about to go to. You see, every time I do a car video, I take you to the engine and we talk about the horsepower and the torque. But never have I stopped to explain to you the complicated relationship between those two and why torque is so important. We're going to address all that right now. <music> Okay, aside from emissions and heat, the two big outputs of any engine are horsepower and torque. You know all about the first one. You've heard about it since you were a little kid. It's in every automotive advertisement. Everything the automakers ever talk about has horsepower in there somewhere. But torque is far less well understood, though extremely important. Let's break them down and define them first. Horsepower is a measure of work. Its definition makes that obvious. One horsepower is equal to 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. Now, torque is also a measure of work, but it describes work as twisting force. It's kind of like horsepower in a circle and without the per minute factor. Torque is measured in foot-pounds, not a certain number of them, though. For example, it may take 27 foot-pounds of torque to loosen a particular bolt on this engine without regard for how long you have to apply that force. So at the risk of oversimplifying, horsepower expresses how much work you can get done in a certain amount of time. Torque is about how hard you can twist something. And that's key, because how does a car move itself? The engine turns, it twists the gears in the transmission, they twist output or drive shafts, and that moves the car. Torque really should be the star. Okay, seriously, let me show you on some charts how horsepower and torque work, I promise you won't fall asleep. Now, these are charts from cars that have been put on dynamometers, basically treadmills for cars. You've seen these. Our partners over at Edmonds do a lot of this kind of testing and gave us this data, and it's very instructive. Here's a 2011 Ford Mustang. Here's how the chart works. On the left, you've got your vertical axis of either foot-pounds of torque or amount of horsepower. Down across the right is basically your tachometer. It's RPMs from 1 to 8,000 in this case. Now look what happens. The torque line is this light blue one. You start building around 2,000 RPM, and you got more and more torque as you increase the revs. You peak right around here at about, oh, 4,200 with 365 foot-pounds. That's all that engine has. And you stay at about that range until around 5,200 RPM. This is the sweet spot. This is where you've got peak torque that just keeps coming. After a while, more RPMs, the torque begins to drop, 
horsepower keeps increasing. Let's look at another car. Here's a very different engine in a McLaren MP412C supercar. Here's our torque line again. Builds gradually, and then notice that about 4,200 all the way out to about 6,200, this guy stays flat and right about at the peak amount of torque, around 415 foot pounds. This is a wider, what they call fatter torque band. You've got more RPMs where you have full torque from the engine. Mercedes Benz S63, instructive because this is a twin turbo V8. Look what happens with turbos. This is the torque line. It's out of hand. It peaks really fast and it stays broad chunky and 611 foot-pounds of torque, that's a lot by the way, for a very long time before it begins to degrade. And finally, a very different car, a Scion FRS. Peaks here early at only 143 foot-pounds of torque, but then look what happens. You get this dip here. If you ever hear me driving a car and say, I feel like there's a flat spot in the torque curve, that's what I'm talking about. It's not flat at all. It's actually a dip where the car feels kind of gutless, and then up around 4,800 RPM, it kicks back in again and stays nice and flat all the way out to the mid-6,000s. Now, you may have noticed in all these charts, torque tends to peter out as you get to the higher RPMs up near your red line. That's because the engine is less able to breathe efficiently there. Secondly, notice that horsepower keeps climbing even after torque drops off. Why is that? It seems like it's two engines doing different things. Well, even as torque drops off, the RPMs keep climbing, and horsepower is largely a product of RPMs times torque. So we can put those two together and keep that horsepower line moving up because torque is dropping, but only modestly, as RPMs go up in a linear fashion. Okay, I hope you've got a better understanding now of horsepower, torque, the relationship, and how they impact the driving experience of a car. Also note, when we do our car videos, I'll show you those two numbers, and horsepower is usually the bigger, torque is often the smaller, unless that car has a turbo or a supercharger, which artificially puts more in the engine and allows the torque to come higher or as high as the horsepower. That gives you another clue as to what that car is going to be like to drive. Oh, by the way, thanks to one of our viewers, Wushik Choi of Arlington, Virginia, who nudged me to get around to that CarTech 101. That topic was his idea. As a little thanks for sending him one of our new CNET on Cars decals, you can get one as well if you send me a show idea that we use. We're looking for ideas for CarTech 101 or our top five segments. Shoot them at me, oncars at CNET.com. When we come back, top five ways the man is calling the shots on the tech in your car when CNET on Cars continues. Today's graphical display radios with RDS, HD tagging, and cover art were unimaginable in 1957. When GM's Wonder Bar radio was almost like voodoo, you pressed the Wonder Bar and a motor would turn the tuning knob, stopping at the next AM signal. And that's all it did. There was a little slider under the Wonder Bar to set how staticky a radio station you were willing to have it stop at, a concept almost foreign in today's digital radio world. They say today's head units are distracting. I could watch this thing motor back and forth all day. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. You know, modern cars often seem like equal parts hardware, software, and I guess what you'd call lawware. Laws and regulations these days have an enormous impact on what kind of cars are coming out of factories and hitting showrooms, whether you or the manufacturer like it or not. Here's some proof. You know, it wasn't that long ago that folks were grumbling that requiring seat belts in cars was commie socialist stuff. Today, that commie label is applied to decidedly more high-tech innovations. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five ways the man is changing your car. Number five, autonomous cars. You know, self-driving. Nevada and California recently forced the issue by making these legal. Now the feds are playing catch-up likely to issue national rules by 2016. That's going to signal it's time to open the floodgates of investment in cars that take over 80% of the driving that you don't really want to do anyway. Number four, distracted driving regulations. 
The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has been floating these tortured proposals for limiting in-car distraction, like saying that a text display should have no more than 30 characters at a time, or any screen-based task should take no more than two seconds. They clearly haven't used an Android phone, have they? Whatever the specifics, this federal push will be what moves distracted driving to the same level of stigma as DUI. Number three, rear cameras. This rule's been delayed more times than BlackBerry's comeback, but the feds are close to requiring a backup camera in all new vehicles, perhaps by late 2014. The car makers say it's gonna jack up the price of a car too much, but most likely they don't wanna lose the ability to make the rear camera a desirable option instead of a standard feature. Number two are black box data recorders. They're already in 90 plus percent of late model cars, probably yours, bet you didn't know that but the feds will soon require them in all new cars sold. The gripe here is that the feds are gonna require the black boxes, but the states control access to the data, and barely more than a dozen of them even have laws that address it. The number one way that regulations will change cars tomorrow is the new 54 and a half MPG fuel economy standard. That's the level that must be met by the average of all cars sold by any maker as of 2025. It's this incredibly complicated formula they use to figure it out, but still a huge bump from today's 29.7 fleet average, and not that many years away. That means we're going to see three-cylinder engines, turbos in almost everything, hybrids galore, cars that shut themselves off at a stop sign or red light, and electric cars on showroom lots, even if nobody wants to buy one. And it's estimated to add some $3,000 to the average MSRP by 2025. No federal rule will change cars, or the cost of them, as much as this one. To stay on top of all the new innovations happening in cars, the one you have today and the one you'll buy tomorrow, check out our show at CNETOnCars.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. If you get a minute, head over to Twitter, Facebook, or G+, and give us a little love for this episode if you enjoyed it. I assume you did. You're still here. And don't forget, I'm taking your ideas for CarTech 101 and Top 5 segments. Shoot them at me on cars at CNET.com. If I use one of yours, I'll send you one of those cool CNET on cars decals for your laptop lid. And don't forget our website, CNETOnCars.com, to find all those episodes you haven't seen yet and the feed links for the ones that are coming. I'm Brian Cooley. See you next time we check the tech.